Well, good afternoon. It's, it's such a pleasure to be here and to get to introduce um, this year's Alexander Langmuir Lecturer. The Langmuir Lecture is traditionally the keystone event for the EIS conference. Uh, okay, maybe after the EIS skit. Um, but it is the uh, very special event and honors a person who's made a significant contribution to the fields of epidemiology and public health. It's named, of course, in honor of Alexander Langmuir, the founder of the EIS program and longtime head of that program and head of the Division of Epidemiology at CDC for many years. We owe a lot to Dr. Langmuir for what CDC is today. Some of the people in the audience will remember him and I remember him. He was a strong character with strong character and perhaps in that way has something in common with this year's speaker. I'm delighted that Dr. Sandro Galea has accepted to be the Langmuir Lecture honoree for this year's conference. He is one of the preeminent epidemiologists of our times, specializing in the health of urban populations. He's focused on causes of brain disorders, including mood anxiety disorders and substance abuse. He's studied the consequences of mass trauma and conflict worldwide, including as a result of September 11th, the Hurricane Katrina, the conflicts in Sub-Saharan Africa, and American wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. He has long championed what Bill Fage likes to call consequential epidemiology to assure that all of our work is focused on questions that lead directly to actions that improve populations' health. Since this conference theme is so what, it's hard to have a more fitting speaker for our Langmuir lecture. Dr. Galea is currently the Robert Knox Professor and Dean at the Boston University School of Public Health, having previously served as Professor and Chair of the Department of Epidemiology at Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. He's published extensively about social epidemiology, health inequalities, and the health of vulnerable populations. He has more than 600 scientific journal articles. I don't believe those went through the CDC clearance process. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> he, he was named one of Time Magazine's epidemiology innovators and is listed by Thomson Reuters as one of the world's most influential scientific minds for social sciences. A few of us heard Dr. Galea give a talk sort of like this at the American Epidemiologic Society. That is an audience of a lot of old timers. Given what Dr. Galea speaks about, we thought it was gonna be extremely important for him to give this talk for a lot of young whippersnappers who are the future of epidemiology and public health in this country and around the world. So um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Galea to CDC and the Langmuir Lecture. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Simone, Dr. Shuckett, for inviting me. I have had some papers go through CDC clearance. <laughs> I think there's still a few in there somewhere. <laughs> just, just kidding, just kidding. I know it actually works very well. Um, uh, <laughs> no, more seriously, I, uh, I have had the extraordinary um, uh, privilege of working with uh, many colleagues at uh, CDC over the years, and uh, it's always been an honor doing so. It's really a thrill to be here with you today. So thank you all for coming. And uh, I... Um, um, Dr. Shuckett said that um, she, she tasked me with uh, doing the, the talk that I, she had heard me give to the old timers. I've changed it a little bit because um, I wanted to reflect the fact that I assume that you're all much more open-minded than the old timers. And, um, but what I want to do is talk a little bit about a population health lens to improving the health of the public. And the structure of my talk is I'm going to make my argument first and then I'm going to suggest there are five things we're not doing right and offer five different ways of getting around them. And I'm doing this to some extent intentionally to be provocative because I would like to invite you to disagree with me. And I, I'm not entirely sure that I have a solution as much as at least I'm trying to identify a ch some challenges and getting us to think. So having said that, let me plunge right in. So let me start with why we do what we do. And I'm going to start with something that's obvious, but it's obvious and it's important. And I think it has implications for everything else that's going to come afterwards. We are in this room, you're all in this room, not necessarily because of the architectural beauty of this room, you're in this room because you care about populations. 
we all care about populations. And I have a picture, it's actually a, pop a picture I took in India, of a population. It's com comprised of people, they are complex, they have spatial dependencies, they interact with each other, they reflect on each other, but ultimately we care about improving the population's health. Schematically, that's the population, I've rendered it all into sort of gray stick figures, and let's assume that a certain number of persons in the population are going to get disease, those are the blue. What we are here all about is reducing the number of blue. We're trying to remove the number of blue so that there are fewer of those people. That is ultimately, ultimately, what our collective calling is. Now, importantly, what our collective calling is not is this, which is focusing only on one select group with disease and ignoring everybody else. Now, everybody knows this, and you're all saying, why is he telling us this? I'm gonna come back to this, but I actually think that we frequently forget this and how we see our job really influences how we do what we do. So that's my setup. Now let me start with some good news. I'll start with good news because one of the challenges is when somebody stands up on a podium and says, I'd like to offer some things we're doing wrong, it inevitably sort of gets us down the school de sac that says, woe is us. I wanna start by saying, there's a lot of good news. And a lot of that good news actually is directly thanks to people in this room and the people who have come before you. I have deep, deep admiration for the work of this organization and what it's done over many, many years. I'm gonna just show a couple of slides, just two slides of good news. And this, this is sort of underpins everything. I say it's good news, there's a lot of good news. So number one, life expectancy is as crude as it gets as a measure of health indicators, right? But we should not forget that our life expectancy the best documented evidence was from England, which is the longest, you know, was grumbling along in the low 40s for hundreds and hundreds of years. And in the past 100 to 150 years, we have gained 30 to 40 years of life expectancy. That is actually extraordinary. It is unprecedented in human history. And that sometimes I'm in audiences where I ask people this question. I ask a simple question. How would you have made your life decisions differently if you expected to die at 45? Right? When you actually think of it that way, you're like, oh my God, it changes everything about my life. So we actually have changed everything about how people live. And that, of course, as everybody here knows, is in large part, almost exclusively, thanks to the work of, work of public health. So that, to me, is like enormous good news. Now, these are high-income countries. This, you see a number of other low-income countries catching up. But even in low-income countries, this is global child mortality. And the way to read this is uh, the red is the proportion of children dying in their first five years. The blue is children surviving um, in their first five years of life, right? Since 1950, we have made enormous strides. So there's tremendous progress that's happening. And public health can rightly stand tall and take credit for much of this. So I could go on, I could give us an hour talk about all the great things that we've done, but that's not why we're here. We're here because we're trying to provoke ourselves into thinking harder so that we can figure out how we can do even better in the next 100 years. So let's then take a pause and say, how are we falling short? So how do we fall short? Well, there are many ways. I could also spend an hour talk about how we're falling short, but let's just focus on a couple of key metrics. First of all, it's not good enough to say, well, we're doing much better than Central African Republic. It's not a fair comparison. We should compare ourselves to our peer countries. So let's compare ourselves to our peer countries. This is from a, a now well-cited National Academy of Medicine report that shows when you look at things like non-communicable disease mortality, we are 16th or 17th compared to all our peer countries. Now, everybody in this room knows this. We all know that we, our health indicators are nowhere near as good as they should be compared to rich countries. And you must admit, we have a bit of a collective shrug about this. It's almost like eh, we, we just don't do so well at health indicators. But we know this and we accept it and we shouldn't accept it. And the other part about this is although we know this, what we frequently forget is this slide. So the red dot is the United States. The gray dot are all the other rich countries. And all I want you to see is that as recently as 1980, and looking around the room, you know, about half of us were around in 1980, right? We were in the top half of rich countries just 35 years ago. And we have now drifted to the very bottom, not so long after. So the bad news is that we have brought this up on ourselves in the past 35 years. The good news is that presumably we can undo it in the next 35 years. But to do that, we actually need to pay attention to what's causing it. But this is actually extraordinary. Like it's actually an extraordinary, extraordinary statement about what we have done to the state of our health in this country. And what does that look like? Here's what we have come to look like. This is my favorite graph in the whole world, actually. 
So the way to read this is there are two lines. One is women, one is men, but they behave the same way. So you can pretend they're the same line. On the y-axis, which is the vertical, is the rank of the US among the 17 rich countries, high-income countries. And on the x-axis, you have ages. So you see that for newborns, 0 to 1, we are 17th. Um, infants, 1 to 4, we're 17th. We're actually 17th at all age points, see, all the way until you hit age 80. And then we jump to number one. So this is an amazing country to live in as long as you live to age 80 because then you live forever. <laughs> now, the, uh, then the question I ask you is, is this the kind of country you want to live in? And for those of us who are children with the responsibility of bringing more people, growing them up, is this kind of country I would like my children to grow up in? Now you can say, well, you know what? It's because in the US, we don't really care so much about our health. We don't want to spend so much money. We're okay with a bunch of people dying young and you know, kids, they can die. There's lots of them, they're annoying anyway. But it's not true, we actually, I'm saying my kids are annoying all the time, but uh, I don't know about yours. But um, it's not true, we actually spend a lot more on these things than all other countries, right? This is again, now this compares us. We are the purple line, the other colored lines are all the other rational countries in the world. So like we are, we spend a lot more. And in fact, this is my second favorite graph in the world. This is uh, life expectancy on the, on the y-axis and our um, um, uh, spending on the x-axis. See all the other countries are clustered together, they spend more, they get more life expectancy. Not us, we spend more and we get nothing out of it. So it's actually pretty cool. So we've sort of figured this out. So there are really challenges, there are challenges. Now, we could stand here and we could articulate many, many challenges. And many of those challenges will be externally focused. We could actually talk about political processes. We can talk about resource allocations at very high levels. But that's not why we're here. I'm actually here, I wanna turn the lens on us. So I would like to actually discuss five distractions that I think we have had. So I'd like us to actually, us to embrace some of the things that we could be doing better. This is not to the exclusion of other issues that are going on that many others could also be doing, but I wanna talk about five distractions, and then I'm gonna flip to say, from a population health lens, how could, what are five different ways in which we can be doing things? So let me jump into the five distractions. Number one, we have, whether we like it or not, become enamored with the notion of the individual and predicting about the individual. And this is a real challenge, and we sort of have embraced this wholesale. Certainly at the national level, the initial waves around the Precision Medicine Initiative, and this has shifted quite a bit in the, since it launched, sort of was very much in this mode of thinking. But let me just sort of say, how did this, what implications did this have for our thinking? Let me just show you one slide. So this is a slide, this is a from a study that's from the Framingham study, which we run at the Boston University School of Public Health, so I feel like I can pick on my own. Um, this slide looks at a genotype score, and the genotype score is um, essentially we're combining a bunch of SNPs, so it's a more sophisticated way of saying it's not just one gene, it's a genotype score, and on the y-axis you have cumulative incidence of diabetes, right? So what you see is genotype score less than 15, 16 to 20, 21, and you see this beautiful dose-response curve, right? This is like epi-101, dose-response curve. Now when you look at that, almost inevitably, what do you think to yourself? See the genotype score? You're like, huh. I wonder what my genotype score is, <laughs> right? I mean, come on, admit it. Like, that's what you think. But of course, you know somewhere in the back of your mind, but we keep forgetting that that slide is entirely compatible with this slide, which is also in the same paper. Genotype score on the x-axis and two curves, people with diabetes, people without diabetes. Now look at the genotype score. Now do you think that your genotype score matters? No, of course not, because the genotype score does matter but it matters at the population level. But it actually matters hardly at all for me as an individual. When we focus only on the individual, we forget this fundamental, fundamental theorem of, how, of the science behind population health, which is that observations at the population level don't matter so much for the individual, and as a result, we need to keep our thinking at the population level. Let me ask you this question. What measure of association, what relative risk or odds ratio do you think you need at the population level for it to matter to the individual? Two, four, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand, but come up with an answer in your own head. Six, 10, how many of you have published papers with an odds ratio of more than 10? Oh, a couple. Well, if anybody in the country does, it's you all, because you actually, you find out real things. So it's actually cool. <laughs> um, so right, what odds ratio do you need? Well, the answer is 350. 
So this is uh, from a great paper by Margaret Pepe and her group. And we look at the bottom right, odds ratio 350 is where you actually have curve separation. So distraction one, we need to make sure that we maintain our thinking at the population level and that whatever we do, we, do, we never let our si keep our eyes off the prize. And this is not in any way a critique, I just want to be clear, not in any way a critique of uh, precision medicine, personalized medicine, simply saying that these things must always be balanced with our focus on population health and that our science helps us identify population needs, not individual needs. Distraction one. Distraction two. And this is where epidemiology really takes a beating. So we are obsessed with isolating individual causes. So for those of you who haven't done a PhD in epidemiology yet. I will in the next 30 seconds tell you all you need to know and uh, then you can dispense yourself with it. <laughs> um, modern academic epidemiology has really been obsessed with saying I want to figure out what X is associated with Y and now we have spent 25 years trying to come up with ever better ways of controlling for all the other variables so we can say convincingly that X equals Y. That's really what we have done. And where has that led us? Well, it has led us to a number of places. So here is one well-known observational study. Um, uh, this is from the Nurses' Health Study from Boston, from the other school of public health in Boston. Um, um, I, I picked up my school first. In my defense, in my defense, I picked up my school first. Um, um, we, uh, where, which shows estrogen replacement therapy is actually associated with lower risk of incidence of cardiovascular disease. Many of you will remember this study, and many like it, around the turn of the century. Resulted in a, you know, one of those studies that launched a thousand ships of uh, estrogen replacement therapy, until, of course, we do an experimental study which shows, actually, oops, estrogen replacement therapy was killing women. So, like, okay, small mistake there. Then, um, you know, nutritional supplement, ginkgo biloba associated with lower incidence of dementia, observational data, until we do an experimental study saying, oh, actually, just kidding, it does nothing for your dementia, except you keep forgetting to take the ginkgo biloba. Um, um, and of course, the, 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 the granddaddy of it all, beta carotene, associated with reduced risk of lung cancer, until we did an experimental study and said, oh, actually, sorry, it's killing people. Um, uh, so why, why is this? Every single one of these studies, these are good studies. They are internally valid studies. They are done well by good people, representing data as best as they can. I want to be very clear on that. These are inter internally valid studies. The problem with all of them is that they've tried to isolate. They're trying to isolate a single cause while adjusting for the world that cannot be adjusted away. Because populations are complex and they embed reciprocities, discontinuities, spatial relationships, all of which you cannot adjust away. Remember my first four slides I showed you when I said this is obvious and you're all going to be rolling your eyes? That's why I showed you a picture of population. Because what we're trying to adjust away are those very real characteristics that you just cannot wash away. Now what does this lead to? Well, it leads to this. This is the infamous cartoon that today's random medical news is that coffee causes depression in twins, and, or equally well, I could have said smoking causes heart disease in, low income, in two income families. Just the other day, of course, as everybody knows, a big paper came out which made a splash, again, from my institution, that said that uh, you know, diet soda is associated with, uh, what was it? It was something bad. Alzheimer's. It was great. I was at a dinner the night before and somebody casually over dinner said, oh, it's okay, I'll just wait till tomorrow until they publish the other study saying it's protective. And I'm like, <laughs> I mean, people are laughing at us. It's very bad. It's embarrassing. Um, and the reason for the problem is that we are trying to isolate, isolate things that are not isolatable. Why is that? Well, here, this is from the Foresight Group in, uh, in London, um, this is a systems model of what's driving obesity. And this model is pretty complicated, right? But if you read it, and you probably can't read it, but there are things like energy expenditure, your will to eat, energy in, energy out, right? And when you look at something like this, you say, wow, if that's really what causes obesity, it's pretty hard to isolate a single cause and to wash everything else away. You just have to pause for a second and reflect on how complex the world is to realize that actually washing things away is probably not the right approach. And of course, then you realize even more how much is the case when you realize that I'm actually not showing you the full model. That's just the inside of that model. That's the model of obesity. And of course, that's probably a simplification itself. So distraction two, we keep trying to isolate causes when we are dealing with complex systems that don't lend themselves easily to simple isolation. Point three, we argue a lot about what is a cause. We argue a lot about attributing things to particular causes. And these arguments are really consequential for, for funding flows. 
So the, um, this is from uh, a classic paper from CDC. This is from uh, Bill Fagy, who was mentioned earlier, um, and Mike McGuinness. And um, when they initially published their initial paper, which was then updated by uh, Dr. Smogdad and uh, colleagues, they published a paper that showed that uh, tobacco, poor diet, alcohol, microbial agents, toxic agents are the, what they call the actual causes of death. So they moved the discussion from saying the causes of death are heart disease, lung disease, etc., to saying it's tobacco, poor diet, alcohol consumption. And this was a very important paper, but it actually ended up being one of the foundations of the healthy people thinking, and it shifted our focus from the pathological, the end cause of death, to a little bit more upstream. So taking this paper as a base, we eventually did a paper, if you actually read the um, Bill Fagy editorial that accompanied the Ali Mokdad paper in 2003 that redid this. In it, Bill Fagy said, well, one of our next big challenges is to try to go a little bit more upstream and quantify a little bit more upstream. So it took us seven years um, listening to Bill Fagy's challenge, and we did that, and we published a paper, which came out and showed, using the exact same methods, attribution of, these, of, of death to low education, low social support, racial segregation, income inequality, poverty, etc., and showed that, the quantify, that you can quantify about the same number of deaths as from low education as from acute heart attack. Same number of deaths from low social support, 179,000, as much as stroke, 167,000. So you see the two columns just to show comparability. And when we published this paper, we knew what would happen, and one of those things was entirely predictable, which then erupts a furor about, well, this is not a cause, that low education is not a cause, low social support is not a cause, just like if you actually were to go back saying, well, tobacco is not the cause, toxic agents are not the cause, the cause is your blocked artery. And we spend a lot of time talking about this. And I actually think this is just time wasted. Of course these are all causes. Of course tobacco is a cause. Of course poor diet is a cause. Of course low education is a cause. Of course income inequality and poverty are causes. These are all parts of complex causal webs. And we are simply misspending our time if we keep trying to think about isolating simple causes and trying to think about some fairly artificial definition of what is a cause and what isn't a cause. In epidemiology, there's a, there's a robust literature that says we should only think of causes as things that we can change, which is utter nonsense because A, a cause is not dependent on whether we can change it or not. It is or it isn't. And B, how many times in history have we said we cannot change something only to turn around and change it the next day? Now, I have good news on this, or bad news, depending on your perspective. We've been arguing about things like this in public health for almost 200 years now. So this is uh, Edwin Chadwick and William Farr, two of the founding fathers of public health, who were around the same time as the, when John Snow Pub was actually a real pub. Um, uh, the, um, and I don't know if people know the story, but they argued quite a bit about attribution of cause, because William Farr said that children were dying of poverty, while Edwin Chadwick, who was more of a politician, said not true, they were dying of nutrient deficiency. And uh, they went on and on. Of course, Edwin Chadwick won, and uh, it was, uh, it, that was the word that went out. But even then, we're arguing about attributing causes, and it matters. It matters how we attribute causes. And I think this is a complete distraction. And, and, and in part, we are driven to this distraction by our insistence on trying to isolate causes, when in fact, we should simply accept there are many complex forces that shape the health of populations, and let's figure out how to grapple with them. That's distraction three. Distraction four. Distraction four is we keep forgetting about ubiquity. We keep forgetting about the forces that are all around us that matter a lot. I'll show you one concrete example. Um, uh, this is the uh, crack baby epidemic of the mid 80s, which, um, you know, it was important. It resulted in a lot, of, a lot of money being spent on it. But essentially, the argument was the gestational cocaine exposure was resulting in developmental delay in children. There were early childhood signs and symptoms. And study after study in the long term showed that actually there was no real long term difference in uh, how these children were functioning. This is the Peabody vocabulary test. The gray bar are kids who were exposed to gestational cocaine exposure, and the, the white bars are the control. But there was something different about these kids. There was something different about its kids, but it really wasn't linkable to gestational cocaine in the long term. What was different about them was this, was environmental stimulation in the environment they were growing up in. Because these kids were almost all ubiquitously kids living in poverty. So these kids had enormously different set of surroundings. And what we were focusing on this one particular exposure was a reflection of this larger set of influences from which there was no escaping. And we 
keep doing this. We keep forgetting these ubiquitous forces. This is, leads me to my sort of my favorite metaphor, which is this. So this is, as a dean of a school of public health, I, have, um, I don't have much time. So I don't have much time for pets, but I have a pet goldfish. This is my pet goldfish. And I want my pet goldfish to be healthy. So I care about my pet goldfish. So I tell my pet goldfish, in order for you to be healthy, you need to swim around your bowl 10 times clockwise, 10 times counterclockwise every day so you can exercise. And I tell my pet goldfish, when I feed you little flaky stuff, don't eat too much so you don't get fat. And I tell my pet goldfish, when you have a goldfish companion, make sure you have safe goldfish sex. Right? <laughs> I mean, raise your hand if you don't think that sounds like modern public health. <laughs> and one day I walk into my living room and my goldfish is dead. And I say, but how could it be? I was exercising, I was eating well, I was having safe sex. How could it be dead? Then I'm like, ah. I forgot to change the goldfish's water. And this is the mistake that we make all the time, that we forget about forces that are ubiquitous and all around us, and we focus only on individuals. Distraction four. Distraction five, we focus, we actually talked a lot about this today in earlier conversations. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, we, 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 we're compelled, and many, many times because of political pressures, understandably, to focus on urgencies to distract us from what's really important. And you all deal with this much more than I do, um, uh, with, for a good reason. I mean, you're dealing with outbreaks all the time, this is sort of the Ebola stuff, and you, everybody here knows that, that these are important issues. Of course, everybody also here knows the scale of number of people affected by things like Ebola, HIV, and flu, and the, and the burden on society. But forget that. Let's talk about this actually something a little bit more, taking a little bit more out of the heat of the public eye. Things like obesity, right? This is, these are all your data. The extraordinary obesity epidemic, 1990 to 2010. So in, in 20 years, we've doubled the number of people who are overweight and obese, right? So something's changed. Well, what hasn't changed? Well, likely what hasn't changed is our genes that determine our obesity, right? Something's changed, but it's probably not our genes. Well, so what have we done about that? Well, here's our funding on genetics. Um, uh, what are the things that have changed? Well, here are things that have changed. Look at food, 20 years ago and today. Look at the calories, bagels, 140 versus 350, muffin, 210 versus 500, cheeseburger, pasta, etc. That's changed in the past 20 years. And what's our funding for behavioral factors, things like that have done? That's what that's done. So our focus on a particular lens driven by what we find compelling today, what we find in media today, frequently clouds our capacity to look at the important. And again, I, I, I don't say this in any way um, uh, out of naivete about the challenges that we face when we have immediate urgent concerns. But I'm trying to here label it so that when we're actually collectively dealing with these issues, we can we at least understand the frame within which we're operating. So those are five distractions. Now I want to move to sort of five different lenses. And I'm gonna frame this in this rubric of sort of population health science. And population health science, as far as I'm concerned, is ultimately the science that underlies what we all do, what we're all interested in. It's the study of conditions that shape distribution of health within and across populations, and of the mechanisms through which just con these conditions become health. Right, that is roughly what you all study, what we all study, what you all act on. So we published this book last year, um, um, which uh, with my colleague, uh, Catherine Keyes. And in this book, we centered our thinking around population health science around nine principles. And depending on your perspective, well, I guess you can have three perspectives on the, on the book and its nine principles. Number one is you can think we're all wrong, which is fair enough. We can discuss that. Number two, you can think that some of these principles are obvious. Or number three, you can think, well, they're obvious, but we actually don't pay attention to them, and it would be helpful for us to elevate them to give us a lens through which we can look at how we do what we do. So, I'm not going to go through nine principles. I'm going to just talk about five of them in the interest of time and also to balance out that I started with five distractions. So I want to talk about five core concerns of population health science that I think could, if we keep them in mind in everything we do, inform how we do our work, how we do our science, and that will have implications for the health of the public. So let me start with number one. Number one, and, and as you'll see as I'm going through, this sort of mirrors some of the distractions I talked about earlier. Number one, we have to be concerned jointly with individual and context. Not one or the other, both. Not, this is, I'm not saying we should not be thinking about genetics 
and individual behavior. No, I'm saying we need to think about genetics, individual behavior, and about context. Now, let me make, let me, let me make this argument mathematically. And I'm going to ask you this question. How much of your cognitive ability, or your IQ, your brains, your smarts, is attributable to your genes? So you're in this room because you're smart. It's just how it works. Okay? And let's make an assumption, a simple assumption that there are two things that make you smart. Your genes and the environment in which you were brought up. That seems like a reasonable assumption, right? Genes and environment, the two things matter. So given that those two things matter, my simple question for you is, what percent of your smarts is due to your genes? And I would like everybody to come up with an answer in their own head. I'm not going to make you write it down or raise your hand. But I would like us all to be honest, hold ourselves accountable, and come up with an answer. And then I'll give you the answer, and then we can raise our hand to see how many of us were right. So what assumption, two things matter, genes and environment. What percent of your smarts is due to your genes? Everybody have an answer? Yes? Even you all over here? Yes? OK. So let's do the math. Let's go back to a population. This is a population. And I'm going to represent the population by representing people with a gene and people with the positive environment. The, when the gray becomes black, so the black is the gene, the smartogenic gene, okay? And I'm going to use the same pattern of smartogenic gene uh, consistently through my example. And the smartogenic environment is in green. And my schema is black plus green becomes smart, right? Gene plus environment becomes smart. Black plus green is going to become red. I have one exception in this, which I'm going to throw in a few random smart people, because we all know people who you can't figure it out. Like their parents are like, ugh. And they grew up in a <laughs> terrible environment. But um, they're still smart. They're like dandelions, right? It's a, it's a, so those are the dandelions. <laughs> but apart from those exceptions, black plus green equals red, OK? Scenario one, mostly green environment. You see the few red, red dandelions. You see the black. With, I'm showing the black just as dots stipple, just so you can see them behind the green, right? So the black genes I showed you before, they add up to the green and they become red. So black plus green becomes red. In this, we can calculate what's the risk of being smart given gene. Now notice something here. Do you notice that everybody with the gene became smart? Do you see that? So your relative risk of smart given gene is about four and the population attributable risk proportion is 100%. So the answer to what percent of your brain is due to your genes is 100%. Not so fast. Second scenario, exactly the same gene pattern. You see the same black pattern, but I changed the environment. See how the environment is now green, only on the side? And there are only two of the black now in the green. Those two become red. I can calculate the same thing. Relative risk of brains given gene is now 1.7. The PARP is 40%. So the risk of being smart given gene is now only 40%. There's all these people with the gene, they did not become smart. I did not change the gene. I did not change the gene outcome association at all. But let me go back to the question I asked you. What percent of your brain is due to your gene? The answer is only one answer. I cannot tell unless I also know the environment. With the simple assumption that gene and environment both matter, you cannot tell what percent is due to one of them without knowing the other. It's also true of the environment, by the way. It's true conversely, right? You cannot tell what percent is due to the environment without knowing the gene. So I'll let you yourself look within your soul and figure out how many of you got that one right. <laughs> Having spoken to a few smart audiences, five to 10 people got it right. Because we inevitably jump to thinking about, oh, I can solve this. I can simplify and I can solve this. But actually we can't, we cannot solve it. We need both. Now, is this all theoretical? Is this just an epidemiologist doing like fancy math? No, it's actually not. This has been published for at least a decade. This is Eric Turkheimer and his group uh, at Columbia who've long shown that the genetic variance for things like IQ is entirely dependent on socioeconomic position or other measures of environment. So we actually know this, but it's a mistake that we, keep, that we keep making and we just need to move away from. Number two, if you accept my premise that we should move away from causal isolation, we just need to get more comfortable with embracing methods that can deal with complexity. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been using obesity as an example for obvious reasons. Um, um, and we know there are many factors that cause obesity. So we know that 
poor food environment, for example, is a cause of obesity. This is some New York City slides. And uh, we know that neighborhoods and food environments are associated with obesity. We also know that, that poor education is associated with obesity. So the first map with the darker color showed areas with poor food environment. Second map shows areas with uh, poor uh, education. But we want to be able to ask questions like this. What is our greatest return on investment to lower obesity? Improving food store availability or improving school quality? And unless we deal with this using complex systems analytic approaches that can take into account the complexity of a system without just trying to isolate one cause and, um, and control everything else, we cannot answer this question. But you can using the right methods. I mean, so this is one answer we gave, this is one paper we, we, we produced. I mean, we may be wrong in this paper, other scientists should actually do their own papers and challenge us, but we're able to come up with an answer using complex system methods actually showing that the big drive drop in obesity is driven by school quality, not by neighborhood environment. But you cannot even tackle these questions unless one starts to grapple with complex systems methods and complex systems approaches that deal with the complexity of systems. Point three, I, I don't think we can forget about mechanism. I think at core, we need to get good at, yes, bringing together individual and context. Yes, we need to be able to use the methods that allow us to do that. But at the end of the day, pathology and disease happens under the skin. So thinking about understanding mechanism is a critical part of what we do. Discovery science is a critical part of what we do. And I think I've long admired CDC for doing that, for being able to combine discovery science with real public health of consequence. I just want to show you two examples from some of our own work. This looks at um, post-traumatic stress. And what this is, is on the x-axis, you have moms with number of post-traumatic stress symptoms. So if you go from left to right, these are moms who had more post-traumatic stress. The green bars, the green, are children. And if the children had a traumatic event, it's how many symptoms of post-traumatic stress the children themselves had. The darker the green, the more symptoms the kids had. So if you go from left to right, all I want you to see is that you have more of the dark color. So as the moms had more symptoms, their kids, if they had an adverse experience, they also had more symptoms, right? That's actually really interesting. And it raises the question, why is that? Like, what are the mechanisms that are explaining that? What are the mechanisms so we can actually figure out how to intervene and mitigate them? This is then from another follow-up study we did where we actually showed that some epigenetic patterns, some methylation around the MEN2C1, which is a functional gene that makes people vulnerable to post-traumatic stress, makes you more vulnerable to post-traumatic stress symptoms. It's entirely plausible that this is transmitted from mother to child. And the way to read this graph is you go on the x-axis is more methylation. The lines are number of post-traumatic events. The top line is more post-traumatic events. The bottom line is less. But what you see is at every level of methylation, you have more trauma is worse, but methylation modifies the amount of trauma. So this is one mechanism. Again, I don't know if this is right or not, but it's a focus on mechanism to say, it's not good enough to say there are things outside the skin that shape the health of populations. It is also part of our job to understand the mechanisms, and it's part of our job to understand the mechanisms so we can explain it, if nothing else, and also so we can mitigate. Point D, a concern with what matters most. This is my only point where I feel like I'm I'm being a little bit controversial, given, uh, given the context, but I thought it was important to at least just talk about this. Um, um, so uh, let's talk about a big public health problem that is difficult, it's difficult to deal with within the political environment, but we certainly can and have a responsibility to deal with it in academic schools of public health, which is this. This is number of people who die from guns in the US. This is just children and teens showing how much the US um, has a lot more kids who are dying from guns than in other countries. What have we done in response to this as a country? Well, one of the things we've done is focus on mental illness. There is bipartisan agreement that mental illness is the problem. Is that true? Well, when you look at data, you see that people with mental illness are indeed more likely to have violent behavior. You can also look at much other data that shows that people with mental illness are much more likely to be victims of violent behavior. But leaving that aside, it is true that people with mental illness are more likely to have violent behavior. So what have we done? Well. We've had a lot of approval for, think, for removing guns from the hands of people with mental illness. This is the um, um, uh, national instant check system showing the exponential increase of removing guns, particularly people with mental illness. And the question then is, is this likely to matter very much? 
Well, let's do a simple thing. Let's compare the United States to a natural experiment called Canada. We tend to forget about Canada because there's this notion that Canada is somehow different. I have spent many years of my life in Canada. It is exactly the same as the United States, only slightly colder, and they have national health insurance. Um, um, <laughs> here's the prevalence of psychiatric disorders in the US and Canada. Bipolar disorders, major depression, anxiety disorders, are roughly the same, certainly within standard margin of error. And here's firearm homicide in the United States, right? So it's not really what matters most. It's not really what matters most. What's causing the difference at the end of the day is the availability, ready availability of firearms in the US. That's what's causing it. And there is actually abundant evidence on this, this from meta-analysis that simply shows this, that actually more availability of guns, more people are gonna die from guns. Now this is a politically charged issue. I realize that. And I'm, this is in, it's a nonpartisan statement. I'm simply trying to rest on the data that says we should engage with a question, if we're gonna engage with a question, at the level of what really matters. And on this issue, the issue of mental illness is a red herring. If we actually want to engage with this issue, the issue really is the availability of guns. Now, whether or not we can engage with that issue is highly complicated and highly political, and I realize that. But it is really bracing to say to ourselves, all we're doing is actually tackling something which is at core a distraction with the concern of population health. That's point four. And point five, I think we need to embrace the challenges of balancing health equity and efficiency. And it's something that we have not been particularly honest about, something that we've been particularly flexible about. So let me start with health, health equity. This compares the United States in terms of our under five mortality per thousand live births to selected countries. Nothing surprising here. I already showed you we do worse than other countries, but I showed you we do worse than other rich countries. Here I'm showing you we do worse than countries like Cuba and Greece. And you know, Greece has a hard time getting anything right, but they still kill fewer children than we do. Um, um, so I showed you that, but of course, you can overlay Ethiopia. This is the same graph, exactly the same graph. All I've done here is just changed the y-axis so Ethiopia fits. And you can choose any number of other countries. So there are huge inequities. This is across countries, but there are huge inequities within the United States. This is um, from National Academy of um, Medicine report that looked at inequality and in life expectancy in the US. This is for women. You can do the same thing for men, showing the increase in life expectancy for the richest 20% of women, the plateauing of life expectancy for the middle 60% of women, decrease in life expectancy is projected for the poorest 20% of women. Essentially saying that our life expectancy increase for women is driven by increases in the richest 20%. My challenge is presenting the slide is that I'm always in rooms with the richest 20%, as is this room, right? But these are the inequities that we are actually dealing with. And the question is, is this a core concern of population health? And I would argue that it's a strong core concern. But if it is a core concern, then we need to grapple with the question of whether, of whether we are doing things that aspire to narrow these health gaps and whether we are willing in making an effort to narrow those health gaps to sacrifice potential overall efficiency gains that we could achieve if we ignore the health gaps. And let me show you one illustration this is from the book. So this is a simple illustration. Supposing before an intervention, you have two communities, and you have DALI's 50 disability adjusted li li uh, life years, 50 and 50 both communities, and you intervene. And you intervene, and the uptake of your intervention is, as it is with many interventions, much higher in high SCS neighborhoods. So now you've intervened overall, and what you've done is you've actually introduced an inequality. So your highest CS neighborhood has now gone to 60, while your lowest CS neighborhood has gone to 55. Now, you can say, okay, but now our overall DALIs is 57.5, right? So is it okay? Is that okay that we've gone from 50 to 57.5 and introduced a gap of five? My answer is, I don't know. I actually don't know if it's okay, but I actually think we should be honest about it and grapple with it. And I think a population health science that's forward-looking and future-oriented needs to be honest about these challenges. This is a challenge. Because of course, you can say, there's probably a different way of structuring the intervention in such a way that you don't go up to 57.5 overall, you go up to 56 overall, but you maintain no health gap. Is one preferable to the other one? I actually don't know. I'm not here with an answer, but I think these are the kind of challenges that we need to surface and grapple with. 
and this all often brings me to this, to, to this paradigm, which is that at the end of the day, what we do in, po in population health and what I'm sure you're dealing with, as you're at the much harder end of population health than I am, I have the luxury of being in university where you know, people can have fanciful thoughts that are completely ungrounded from reality. I get that. You actually have the, you actually have the responsibility of doing stuff. And uh, that is, you have my undying respect. People often say to me, like, you know, like, would you ever consider working for government? I'm like, no, it's just such a much harder the job you all have than the job I have. Um, um, but I've really come to feel like we have these two axes, and one axis is values, and the other axis is knowledge. So the way to read this graph is knowledge is on the, is on the x-axis, and values is on the y-axis. So the right-hand column are things that we know. The left-hand columns are things we don't know. The top row are things which we actually feel like we should act on. The bottom row are things that society we don't feel like we should act on. So look at, look at the grid. On the top right, polio eradication. We know what to do, and we value eradicating it, and we're close to doing it, right? The bottom left, things related to guns. We actually don't know very much what to do because we haven't done much research, and societally, we're not really ready to tackle this issue. That's at the bottom left. Now look at the off-diagonals. Injection drug use harm, things like safe, um, safe syringe exchanges. We actually know that these things work, but we're not comfortable with them. Our values are not comfortable with them in society. Now look at top left, Zika. We acted on Zika today. I was the privilege of being at this fantastic lunchtime presentation that really showed how CDC and organizations like it in the world, although nothing's really like CDC, can really act and make a really big difference even as you're, you're collecting the science. You didn't sit down and sit there and wait to collect the science. You acted at the same time as we were learning, right? So Zika, we really wanted something to be done. You did something about it, even though we didn't really know enough. So the question about this paradigm is this. If you agree that there's something to this paradigm, should we collectively be acting only on the knowledge axis? Shouldn't we also be dealing with the public opinion values axis? And if we should be, what are we doing about that? And I would argue that we actually don't. I would argue that, I sort of feel like you have two choices. One is you can stand up when I finish and tell me I'm totally wrong about this, which is fine, we can discuss that. But if you don't think I'm totally wrong, then I feel like we have to be honest and say, why are we not doing that? Or maybe we are. I would actually argue that insofar as we're doing it, we're doing much less of that than we are of this. And that is what a population health science that really informs improving the health of population needs to do. So I'm gonna end, I'm gonna end with um, what implications this has for public health. I think it has enormous implications for how we frame um, what we do. This is a list of the nine principles, which I'm happy to discuss um, another time. But I think this actually ultimately influences how we think, how we communicate our science, how we translate our science into practice. And what we try to do with these principles, what I try to do here with highlighting five of them, is just to give us a lens and that says, look, there are some things that we're getting distracted by. Here are different potential approaches. And if we agree with those approaches, then how do we hold ourselves accountable every time we're trying to make a ask a scientific question, every time we're trying to translate that scientific question into practice? It's really a privilege being here. Thank you for having me. So um, we have some time for questions. Please come to the microphones and identify yourself. Hi, um, that was a wonderful presentation. Just uh, focusing on that um, two by two um, piece, if you could put that slide back up again, the, the, the four yeah. cells. I have, I have no control oh. of the slides. <laughs> um, the gentleman in the back would need to put the slide up, back up. Okay. Is that possible? I can, well, I can mime it, sorry. I, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'd just like to ask you if you would to look at that uh, with us and, um, and, and think about the we that you talked about and, and ask ourselves about alternate facts um, <laughs> on the bottom line. <laughs> Um, um, well, I think I can answer the question without the use of a visual aid. Um, um, I, I uh, you know, I'm not sure how to answer this because I'm, I'm trying to be very careful not to say anything that gets any of us in this room in trouble in an active way. Um, um, I think there are some things on which the science is decided. 
And um, I actually think we should not be afraid of saying that. Or let me rephrase that. I actually think I have a responsibility to always say that, not be afraid of saying that. And I fully appreciate that when you're actually working within, gov within government, there are very different set of pressures. So I think issues like global environmental climate change, the science has decided. I think issues like whether or not having access to lethal means of killing yourself is associated with you being more likely to kill yourself is decided. And I actually think that those of us in science have a real responsibility to say that. And that's certainly what I've been trying to do. Um, the extent to which that, of course, translates into action is much more complicated. That's a much more complicated question. Hello, uh, my name is Megan McCarthy. I am a Master's of Public Health student at the University of Florida, so please excuse me for being a novice. Um, however, my question kind of goes off what you were saying at the very end in regards to how we communicate science. Um, my question is, what can public health professionals do to address the issue with this growing movement of pseudoscience and not having just a very huge distrust towards the scientific community in regards to things like, are vaccinations safe, things of that nature? Yeah, I, I think, um, 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 in front of me there's a haiku contest. And inequality is actually, it's one of those moments in life. Like, okay. Um, uh, <laughs> I, um, I actually think that um, we are, two, two answers to that. Number one is we are losing. If, if we allow some of the alternative fact nonsense to gain currency, including in things like vaccine, it means we are losing and we're not doing our job well enough. It should be part of our job to fight it. I'm not saying it's easy, but I actually think we've been reluctant warriors on the axis of changing values and changing public opinion. And, and we need to accept that that, right, that's what the vertical axis I was showing, that that's part of what we do. That's number one. Number two is, I, I understand that we keep hearing about the public distrust science. I, I, I give the public a lot more credit than that. I think there is manufactured doubt and manufactured distrust that comes not from a level, level playing field, but from very particular special interests that have a reason and the need to sow mistrust. I actually think if we can effectively push back on that, we, it, it will not be that hard for us to get the public's trust because I think at core, the public is smart and the public likes science and the public like, likes facts, you know, good old fashioned facts, not the alternative ones. Mm -hmm. In the back. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Juliana, I'm a first year AIS officer. Thank you so much for your lecture, that was brilliant. And the question I want to ask is regarding uh, your model for causes of mortality and the going upstream. And my question is, I'm sure we all realize that the reason why we keep downstream is because as public health professionals, that's where we can act the most. If we can identify tobacco as a cause, that's where we can act. And adding the complexity level that you came back to your, in your lecture many times, the, the higher the complexity, the more we had a hands tied to act upon. So how do we deal with that dichotomy and what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think I have the year right, but I could be slightly wrong. In 2004, I was here at CDC doing a talk. And for some reason, the conversation turned to things that are impossible to do at the collective level. And the conversation turned to doing things like what if we made trans fats illegal? And I remember the conversation going, to, well, that's impossible, it can't be done. Until, of course, the week after Dr. Frieden did it in New York. Um, um, so I actually think that what we say is impossible today is radical tomorrow and it becomes um, accepted wisdom the next day. It becomes what we've always done the day after. So I, I'm not willing to accept that these are things that we cannot do. It is part of the job of public health to take what is acceptable and make it unacceptable. Right? To take things that we say these are, these are acceptable. It's acceptable that we spend far more on health than anybody else and we can't do about it. It's actually not acceptable. It should be unacceptable. And again, I'm, I'm being very careful to be clear that it's the collective responsibility of the entire public health enterprise. And the entire public health enterprise should leverage its different constituents cleverly. And insofar as there are things that universities can do that the public sector cannot do, we should push the universities to do those, and universities need to embrace their responsibility, and conversely. So I, I, I don't think this is we, the public sector, the academic sector, we're part of the same mission 
And I just want, I'm just trying to urge us to embrace that mission and make sure that we, each of us, do what we can within our, from, from our own perch. Back in the right. Um, it's wonderful to see what you're doing in uh, getting complex systems into the uh, analysis of uh, public health uh, outcomes. And that, uh, uh, because public health has been given a mandate to look at common interests, that is a huge step in the right direction. But if we look over long periods of time, we could also consider the incorporation of feedback loops uh, in, into this process and, and to consider how this is affecting the evolution of, of our civilization. Um, uh, so, for example, what you've shown in uh, the, the United States standing relative to other uh, wealthy nations, that's the propagation of a design defect. And uh, by, by the same token, uh, a global warming is the propagation of a potential extinction process. Um, so uh, I, I noticed you published with Rod Wallace, uh, Roderick Wallace, and uh, uh, the, 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 these propagation events. Uh, I, I wonder if you could comment on, on, on the notion of a, a propagation of uh, design improvements as, we, uh, as humanity gets away from sleepwalking with the enormous uh, risks that we're exposing all of life to, uh, and, and to, to look at a, a broader view of what humanity's mission is on, on this earth. <laughs> Yeah, one of the things which I've tried to do in my career is work with people who are far smarter than I am, and that has served me well. Dr. Wallace is one of those people. Um, um, I think the, um, what the complex systems approach teaches us is that small, seemingly innocuous changes, they're propagated, to use your word, down the chain, and they manifest in enormous, in enormous differences. So go back to the life expectancy that I showed over the past 35 years as to how we've fallen behind. Why is that? Have we, do we have less medicine? Do we have worse diagnostic tests? Do we have less discovery science? Do we understand pathogenesis less? Absolutely not, none of those things. What has changed is a slow disinvestment in the HS part of HHS and the human services part, the infrastructure part. That's what's happened. Those small disinvestments have chipped away at our collective population health. Hasn't happened overnight, but now we've seen their propagating effect. And we need to be vigilant to that. One of the challenges I think we have in science is, well, you can't say that until you actually have 10 years of longitudinal data. That's true. This goes back now to what I can't do, but you can do. I think there are things I can say, you can, I can say and you cannot say. But then I, I think there are things that are harder for me to say. Like, for example, this is going to have implications and we shouldn't wait 10 years. But I think you can do that. So I think collectively, if we see that through that lens, we can try to nip these negative self-propagating events in the bud. In the rear. Hi, my name's Carolyn Robbins. I'm from HRSA, and I'm a social epidemiologist, so I loved everything about your lecture. Um, but I was wondering if you can um, add some more specifics about how we can apply this to our research. You mentioned um, adopting methods that can embrace complexity. Can you describe that in more detail? Um, yes. Uh, so we have a book out on that. It's called <laughs> System Science and Population Health. It's not. Um, you know, it, it, it's not a page turner. Um, um, <laughs> but um, in it, we do have an overview of the state of the science, anything from machine learning to agent-based model to uh, systems dynamic models to compartment models to different approaches that, uh, and the pros and cons. And if you're interested in that, I would encourage you to take a look at that. Okay, thanks. Michael? Uh, Michael Yadabarko, CDC. Um, returning to the first two questioners and a little bit in the others, um, I think it's natural that people in this audience are turning to your two-by-two two table. <laughs> and um, I agree that it's really uh, something insightful to talk about the value issue that you propose. But I'm wondering also about the other axis. Have you thought much about how, not the science or the research, but what kind of scientists we should be and what kind of scientists there are? Um, so for example, some people talk about scientists who are advocates, some people talk about uh, scientific arbitrators, uh, other people talk about sort of collective science like we do with advisory committees. And I think sometimes we, we uh, maybe we should focus more on what kind of scientist we are and where we fit. Have you thought along those lines at all and comment there? Yeah, so we've actually, I've thought about a reasonable amount, both from an <clears throat> intellectual engagement point of view, but from a, from a institutional responsibility point of view. So what I've 
feel like I've tried to do in the past four years with my last two books, leaving aside the system science book. One is population health science. The one that came before it was called Epidemiology Matters, which was a epidemiology methods book that is unlike all the other epidemiology methods books out there. What we try to do there is to deconstruct the canon of epidemiology to teach the same things that we card-carrying epidemiologists want to know, but through a population health lens. And so what we're trying there, we're trying to grapple with this very big question you're asking, which is what kind of science do we want to do to the end of improving population health, and what kind of scientists do we want to create? And if you disappeared, <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was there a second ago. Um, uh, oh, it's back. Yeah. Um, if, if, you, if, you, if you look at this and you say, okay, we want to be able to grapple with issues, with value issues, well, then that should be a remit of those of us who are in population health science, and we need to make sure that we have the relevant expertise. No one scientist can hold all of this within herself, but collectively, we can. I mean, I, I have never been part of, te of teams where we have experts in how to do the y-axis. You all have some of them, but I would argue that it's nowhere near as incorporated as it should be. So part of the, of the intent of the book is to say, here are nine principles. If we agree that we should be able to grapple these in population health science, what kind of scientists do we want as part of the fold? I think you need economists. I think you need ROI experts. I think you need ethicists. I think you need communication experts. I think all of that is part of the remit of population health science that is going to be uh, create a population health science of consequence. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Jeff Whitfield. I'm with the Physical Activity and Health Branch at the Chronic Disease Center. And uh, one of your slides really hit on something that, um, that I try to keep in mind with, 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 with our work. Um, and that was the, um, the fact that our genes are not changing, but the environment is. And, and your example is related to obesity and uh, the caloric content of foods. And I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit more on this apparent mismatch between our evolutionary past and our current surroundings and the implications for public health. So um, the, I, I guess the, uh, a, a little bit more commentary on, on the potential role for evolutionary medicine or evolutionary uh, science in, in, in guiding what we do and shaping uh, some of the work that we do around that. I am. Um I'm not going to answer the second part of your question because I don't know, but I'll answer the first part of your question. Um, um, I, I think we frequently, like science has this irritating habit of being static. And the reason for it is actually very simple, is that somebody publishes a paper and we accept it. Then if 10 years later somebody else tries to publish it, what happens in my system is they're told, oh, you shouldn't do that, it's already been done. You get no rewards for doing things that have been done. So being frustrated by this issue, one, one day I published this paper just to try to, as a proof of concept, and I looked at the very simple, the, 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 what was within social epidemiology accepted that marriage is protective against low birth weight. And what we looked at was that risk ratio over time. And over 15 years, you can say that risk ratio changed tremendously. Why is that? Well, in no small part, it's probably because our environment changed and the notion of marriage changed tremendously. And I'm using that as one example, but we don't do that. We, we were stuck in thinking of things the way they were. So I think somehow in science, we need to challenge ourselves to look at changes and say the world is changing and, and how is what we know changing with it? Now you framed it in the context of evolutionary biology and understanding, and I'm sort of avoiding that just because to be honest, it's not my field, I'm not qualified to comment on it. But the broader question that we are in a changing dynamic world and we need to make sure our science and our understanding evolves with it, that just because we knew something 10 years ago doesn't mean it's actually still true today. We need to keep constantly testing ourselves on that. Thank you. In the back. Uh, thank you. Uh, Sanjeev Sapkota, uh, EIS officer, class of 2003. Um, um, imagine there is a hypothetical country where all the goods of public health are there. 100% are immunized, no teenage pregnancy, everyone wearing, you know, seat belts, and no one has, you know, access to the lethal uh, weapon to self-harm or harm others. Um, you know, on your slide, you know, United States being the dot on the lowest among the, you know, high-income country, uh, and, but having the highest per capita income, I mean, uh, expenditure on health. Um, is that a possible uh, scenario that we can have all the goods of public health in one setting? I mean, isn't a human, is it a human nature or a human kind of a 
dynamics or attitude, you know, something would come that even if you have all the goods that you can have at one time, but then there are always, you know, some factors that, that, that is always kind of, kind of coming and, uh, you know, not letting the highest attainment or the highest achievement of the health. For example, uh, Nepal may not have the highest expenditure for health, but, uh, but then it doesn't have access to the lethal weapon, I mean, uh, to, to self-harm or, the, you know, harm others. But who, on, on the other hand, you know, high, higher income com countries like United States have, have just the opposite. So, I mean, in public health, is that a possibility that we can have all the goods and then uh, that we can have a, like, you know, really, um, you know, kind of a higher certain health? In the, I mean, I just uh, uh, answered your question. Well, I think the best, the best disquisition on that comes from the, from the famous scientist, Dr. Seuss, who talked about uh, trying to get to Sola Solu, the land where there were no troubles, only a few. Um, um, <laughs> Sweden ha has a remarkable health indicators. They have a, actually a functioning health in all policies, health evaluation assessment system, and they have totally messed up dealing with the uh, influx of uh, migrants from other countries and uh, sort of the resulting ethnic tensions. So, I, I don't know any country that's anywhere near perfect, but the good news, here's the great news, that we are so far from perfect that we have a lot of work to do. So, with some luck, we'll all be employed for quite some time. <laughs> Our last question, if you can keep it short, we have time for one more, yes. Uh, I'm Soylent Banerjee, mathematical statistician in environmental health CDC. Uh, congratulations on your very stimulating uh, lecture. Uh, but what I think that what you brought up are, uh, are very interesting, but do you feel that the public health experts have, can only do so much because there are same like limitations. For example, take the example of the gun, gun control. Now you already showed, the com comparing with the Canadian data, that it is having the gun which makes most of the differences. Now, as a public health expert, can you suggest something how to motivate the uh, national thinking, and I'm talking about the politicians who have more say on this rather than the public health experts. I think the don't you think that the, this should be a shared responsibility that mm -hmm. one can do something or, or what is your suggestion on that? Well, remember, you have to remember what I said at the beginning of my talk. I said at the beginning of my talk that I think one could do a totally separate talk that talks about the shortcomings of many sectors that result in some of the challenges we face today. But my talk, I specifically wanted to focus on us. I wanted to look inward at those of us in population health. Do I think at the end of the day it's a shared responsibility? Absolutely it's a shared responsibility. Could I articulate things that within a political system could work better? Absolutely. I, I, I suppose I'm trying to challenge us to be better at what we do. And uh, I'm saying if values matter, then we should engage values. Now how we do that, it's complicated and we should do it within the constraints that we all work within. But ultimately I have tremendous confidence in the capacity of smart, well-intentioned people. And the reason I've spent my adult professional life in public health is because, in general, the modal person is smart and well-intentioned, and I like that. So I actually think there's a lot we can do. No, not alone. Uh, but my attempt here is just to provoke us to just sharpen our thinking so we can do what we really are trying to do better. That's all. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.